Blog Talk Radio. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. The accident was over a year ago. A second woman has been elected president. The twelfth planet has been named in the solar system. The last wild polar bear has died. I slept through it all. Was here for my waking. He called it a beginning. He said it was good. I think he may have thought that anything I did was good. Welcome to Transition Radio, live from Hollywood, Florida, with your host and hostess, Mark Angelo and Jessica Lynn Cummings. Girl trapped in a boy's body. 
Instead, I celebrated who we were as trans women. We have something extra. We can take that literally or figuratively, which is how I chose to read it. We are extra. We are more. We are special. We are <clears throat> everything. I grew up just like these girls, ballsy, sassy, so sure of where I was going and how I was getting there. No one could tell me otherwise. I was a girl with something extra, extra going beyond my genitals, extra as in my refusal to be a victim just because people chose not to get me, extra in the sense that I had a dream and sacrificed a lot to ensure I made those dreams my reality. When I think of the girl I was growing up, the girl I was growing up. I also think of my blind spots as well and how I learned nearly everything I knew regarding hormones, dating, doctors, presentations, self-esteem, document changes, etc. from older women who grew up as a girl like myself. I grew up with women who knew the way to a certain point. They could help me navigate the physical transition process, but they weren't as keen on where to go from there. No one talked to me about life after my teenage transition because education usually wasn't an integral part of the trans women way where I grew up. But when I came out, I was suddenly urged to identify myself. Are you transgender or transsexual? And frankly, I thought this was to be one of the silliest things to be confronted with upon my sharing such a personal story with the world. As a young woman, I only used those terms a few times, mostly because I didn't attach my sense of self to those political or medical terms. They didn't sing to my inner sense of being. They were mere labels meant to organize me and put me in my place. So how did I, I, how did I identify? I was a girl automatically, reared as a boy who rebelled against my family's expectations to be the woman I knew myself to be. <clears throat> as soon as I came out, I was labeled a transgender a trans, as transgender. Mary Claire proclaimed, I was born a boy. Transsexual activists argued that the LGBT establishment was misgendering me by calling me transgender. In the end, I embraced it all because none of them could easily define who I inherently am. But it wasn't until I began speaking to other girls who grew up like I did that I began using phrases like, girls like us. Girls Like Us just seemed to roll off my tongue. The root of Girls Like Us started in private conversations with young women looking for role models, becoming role models, wanting to be heard, and hoping to make a difference. So I got my own girl with something extra. (laughs) Yes, she did. Take it literally or figuratively, however you like. (laughs) That brings me to talk about what are the effects of hormones for MTF and FTM individual in the bedroom. Although Jessica and I have a wonderful and beautiful relationship and sex isn't everything except for us FTM, sex becomes a very necessary evil. There are times where we're just not on the same time frame or needs. I feel that my needs are much more than hers. And I have to blame it on that evil estrogen pill. And um, and I say evil because it kind of kills the sex drive. And I guess because it is chemically induced in the MTF bodies, it's not like a genetic female that has her cycle and has her moments. And, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. I um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about certain studies and research. And... Um, if we look at the world we're designed for the primary goal of maximizing human happiness, the sexual taste of men and women would match up very closely. What could be more ideal than perfect attunement with one's mate? <clears throat> so that both people feel sexual desire at the same times, to the same degrees, and in the same ways. Yet there is ample evidence that romantic partners are sometimes out of synchrony with each other's sexual wishes and feelings. The continuing market for sexual advice, sex therapy, couple counseling, and similar offerings is a testimony to the fact that many people are not perfectly satisfied with their sex lives, even within commitment relationships. Infidelity and divorce may also sometimes reflect sexual dissatisfaction. Many findings suggest that men want sex more frequently than women. That includes FDM. 
In a survey of couples who had been married for over 20 years, the finding revealed that husbands continue to prefer intercourse more frequently than wives. In fact, wives consistently reported that they were quite satisfied with the amount of sex they had in their marriage. <laughs> yeah, right? But men are on average wish for about 50% increase, which is like six days a week. A majority of husbands, 60%, but only a minority of wives, 32%, said they would prefer to have sex more often. A more recent study found that husbands and wives agreed that men were more sexually active and frisky. Would be me, frisky. Another study found that men were more likely than women to report having less sex in marriage than they wanted. With a sample of couples aged 51 to 61, another study found that women were more likely than men to wish for less frequent sex than they were having, whereas husbands were more likely to wish for more frequent sex than they were having. A study of elderly couples in Sweden likewise found that men wanted more frequent sex than women. Yeah, but the women hold the power. Yeah. Because well, the men always want it, and the women can go with that. So just remember that idea. Yeah, that's why we, some of us, I turn day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. You should get more sex. Oh, really? Okay. Um, That's okay. I'm now um, grounding you for a week. <laughs> that's all she ever talks about, grounding for a week. And then I just <laughs> tell her, you want your nails done? And uh, Oh, hell no. You did not just go there. <laughs> anyway... For some post-SRS women, their first sexual experience with a man can be wonderful and strongly influence their future sexuality. For example, one trans woman in her late 20s said after her first ever night with a man, I had discovered sex, a new hobby, more boys into bed. But for others, the experience can be a huge disappointment. One trans woman in her early 40s says of her first experience with men, just worry. I was bored. Have to change the sheets. Another admits. I don't have the sex drive mm-hmm. I had as a boy. My husband wants sex all the time, but I limit it to maybe every other night as it is so boring. This report indicates that estrogen administration to genetic male transsexuals with intact testes reduces sexual activity, orgasms, and spontaneous erections due to their hormonal treatment. Another study found no reduction in film-induced erections in sex offenders whose testosterone levels were supposed were suppressed by estrogen. And MTF's libido was not reflected in the present results of frequency of sexual feelings. However, male to female transsexuals may commonly report a lack of sexual feelings before gender surgery is performed for reasons unrelated to libido status. Which comes to my conclusion, it's all in your head. Yeah, doubt it. Let's talk about what could be done to improve your sex life. Hmm. And boy, I'm trying to find all sorts of different ways to improve ours. So, improving self-image. Learning to accept your genitalia. Realize that the genitals do not make you more of a man or a woman. Engage in visualization techniques. Creating a connection with self and body. Eating a healthy diet that brings the body into balance, such as more alkalizing foods to include kale, spinach, Brussels sprouts, celery, broccoli. Engaging in deep breathing exercises to improve oxygen and blood supply. Minimizing toxins, such as smoking, drinking alcohol, and all preservatives and additives. Increase your consumption of vitamin D. Develop a healthy, playful relationship in the bedroom and change the way you look at sex. It's a gift we have been given by our Creator and empowering tools to enhance the well-being of your body and, most of all, the direct link to your energy source that comes from our planet, Mother Earth. That's kind of like a fruit from the tree story. No, not at all. No? No, not at all. Sex is good. I keep programming that into you. Sex is good. Yes. I think I'm Vince almost. Yeah, somewhat. You now get it uh, three times a week. Instead yeah. of I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to work up the fun. <laughs> We're going to switch gears a little bit here and still talking a lot about transsexual and transgender issues, but we want to bring a little spirituality. We want to bring a little bit of the change that's going to take place on this earth. So we're going to talk about transition and evolution of mankind and our planet. Due to the 
unprecedented events taking place on this planet that do not seem to have been widely understood and are therefore unexpected, it is necessary to lay a strong foundation that evolutionary change has been expected by those who are proficient in understanding cosmic cycles and have encoded their knowledge into Earth, cosmic and galactic calendars. However, how that manifests in our reality is less well understood and has become a major issue that has to be faced by humanity. In summary, we have to understand why when keepers of ancient knowledge like the Maya and the Tiro Indians in Peru state clearly that there has been an overturning of space-time or claims of a tear in the fabric of space-time and that we await the return of the ancestors. Some people continue to build underground bunkers. Because they have to leave the popular but unsustainable belief that the Earth would face destruction, According to religious and sacred texts, many enlightened teachers have been sent to warn humanity, often through allegory and parables, that universal consciousness carries out periodic housekeeping on this planet. At the end of certain cosmic cycles, usually referred to as the end of times, we get a biblical sized flood of galactic cosmic energy. This day, it is widely believed this energy comes from the center of our galaxy, and if humanity are not ready, i.e., the energy of human consciousness on this planet is completely incompatible with the incoming energy and thus not high enough to harness this energy, then massive evolutionary change occurs, usually resulting in devastation and the planet being collapsed. Spiritual teachings retained as biblical parables are highly instructive. A modern translation would be whether the human energy field is strong enough to deflect unhelpful signals in the environment and pick up the new cosmic template that would ensure that we evolve according to man's new evolutionary destiny. Why does that have to be man's destiny? Well, I... Because you were taken out of our rib. Oh, really? Okay, see, the fruit story again. Yeah. God, actually, I believe that we were once both male and female at once, and we were actually a project from a more advanced species who divided us. But we'll get into more of that topic in other shows and definitely looking for inputs from you guys and we'd love to hear what you guys have to say about that in future shows. Now, tonight I'm going to talk how to prevent wrinkles, but let me uh, check if we have any callers here. Let me see. Nope, nope. Oh, yes, we do. We got callers, so we're going to have to wait for the prevention of wrinkles. Let's see. We got caller number one. Call number one, state your name. Where are you calling from? Hey, Mark, it's Thomas. Hey, Tom, how you doing? I'm good. I'm all the way out here in Oregon. Uh, I was listening to the show, and you were talking about the effects of hormones on transgendered individuals. And um, I wanted to put in a note that I don't know about the trans ladies, but for us guys, I've noticed that I'm typically more in the mood right after my shot. That first three days, there's a definite cycle going on there for me. Oh, I know that all too well with this one. Yes, and that's because of that (laughs) beautiful surge of testosterone flowing through our veins. And it has some direct connection with um, mini peeny down there. It's almost like they they communicate. Yeah, and i got to keep them from humping the chair. Oh yeah, my girlfriend, well, my fiance now. She uh, she looks forward to my shot days. You're lucky. Your fiance looks forward to it. Mine dreads it because it's an MTF. Oh come on, it's not that bad. Well, it's funny because for me, I, I typically am um, I'm not in the mood as much as I would like to be. Um, but when I have my shot days, those first two or three days after my shot. I'm really good, but then it kind of mellows out and almost drops down to nothing that last couple of days. Do you inject weekly? I do weekly, yes. Are you uh, doing things as far as um, foods that will enhance and keep uh, your testosterone level up or maybe even some supplementation? Also working out will improve your testosterone rate as well. I find that when I work out, I get more 
more aggressively sexual as well. It kind of creates more of a surge in me. Well, I'm definitely eating the right foods, and I do work out quite often. Um, it's more for me. It's not that it's not on my mind. It's just the motivation to go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, I'm going to bring in the other caller real quick. Stay on the line with us, Tom. Let's see who else we got here. Okay. Caller number two, state your name and where you're calling from. Hey, guys. My name is Cece, and I'm from California. <laughs> Hey, Cece, how are you doing? We're on the line with Tom, and you're on the line with Mark and Jessica. Alrighty. What? Uh, <laughs> well, besides, uh, besides that, what, what, what did you say? I'm sorry. <laughs> What's on your mind besides sex? Um, a, a comparison to, well. Yeah, a comparison to how sex was before I came to terms with myself and I and how I think it's going to be now that I've I'm learning how to love my body. I'm making the changes to learn how to love this body. Um before yeah, I began to like you you understand, I'm sure you guys have I'm sure you guys can relate. Um I haven't however I haven't been involved with anyone since I started this journey, but before, you know, looking back to my past experience, my past experiences, I think uh, it would have been much more enjoyable and fulfilling had I um, had taken the time to really figure myself out. <laughs> That's definitely very important to have a good mind-body relationship and really honor your body. And and like I explained earlier, it's it's you you visualize and you finally almost make friends with yourself and give yourself permission to enjoy that special act our creator has given us to put to others. I, I feel like, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like now I think I might, I might actually be able to, whereas in the past I had a hard time getting close to, to somebody. Cause look, it, I guess it all makes sense. If you don't love your body, how, how can you enjoy being touched, you know? That is true. How do you feel? How do you feel about that, Tom? You, Tom, Thomas. Oh, we made a last one. Well, did I know? Oh, no, no, no. Like NCC. We're gonna try to get Tom back. Yeah, he's not here. He doesn't appear like me. Oh God. I guess he's not. All right, CC, continue. No. I... <laughs> oh, he's still there. I'm still here. Sorry. I'm just listening to CC. Oh. Okay, we thought we lost you. <laughs> no, I was, I was just thinking say. about. I was thinking about CC's story about how, you know, those experiences we had prior to transition, and how they weren't always the most comfortable situations. And now looking back, like for me, transition ten years down the road, um, me seeing myself in a sexual position with a male, ten years ago never going to happen. Now I would be okay with it and have been in the past okay with it um, once I made that physical and emotional transition. So I definitely understand where CC is coming from. Yeah, I find myself too. Prior to transitioning, I would fear men. It was like a fearful thing. And once I transitioned, although I was married to a genetic female for nine years, I started really becoming interested in the male body and would always wonder and used to love to watch male porn. And it's just because now I, I felt at peace with myself and I felt all right with my body and felt that I could contribute to things that I couldn't contribute to before. And you've got the best of both worlds. Yeah, I do. do I? Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm going to share this online. I was a virgin prior to being with Jessica. Jessica was my first. I popped this cherry. Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> about time. Probably, but... <laughs> yeah, that was probably TMI. <laughs> it's about, about time. Yeah, right? 48 years. <laughs> I saved myself for a trash woman who doesn't like to have sex. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it does have a lot to do with like being comfortable with your body and being comfortable with who you are on the inside as well as the outside. 
because for us, it's a lot. I, well, I shouldn't say for us. I think F to M's have it easier to pass. Although Jessica is gorgeous, don't get offended. Um, yeah. I've met a lot of <laughs> a lot of trans women that have a hard time passing, um, and it's harder for them to visualize themselves in that female sexual position because of their external genitalia. Whereas uh, well, for us F to M's, we can wear things. You know, we we can psych ourselves out to a certain extent. Exactly. So I think it's it's a mental thing. It's it's harder to hide the pose than to create the bulge. <laughs> right. But that's that's what I was talking about <laughs> earlier, creating a better self image about self and not identifying with your genitals. Remember, the genitals are there to give us pleasure, and we could try to eliminate them. We could try to have surgeries. So half the time, leave us main and leave us not being able to have orgasms and so forth and so on. So, you know, you you got to use what you got and just look at it differently. And I think that will help transgender individuals evolve and become more sexual beings and be more at peace with themselves. Exactly. Now, here's the problem with uh, male to females, you know, and probably the same goes for FTMs, that society has pushed us so hard to mutilate ourselves and, and maim ourselves just to fit into that other box of the other gender. And, you know, I've seen the work on vaginoplasty. You know, male to female is a two-step process. They do what's called an orchiectomy, and they do what's called a vaginoplasty. And now, you know, the whole thing is, you know, you turn around and you try to go through and have these sex changes and, and change your body and genitalia to conform to that of the opposite sex that you were actually born in with what you were, what you have. So basically when they do that, you're not going to feel it as far as an MTF. You're not going to feel it. They claim that they're coming up with ways to bundle nerves and et cetera and give you feeling within the clitoris, but still it's not, it's not 100%. And um, also the other fact that remains is, you know, the orchiectomy is definitely a health benefit for the MTS because once they remove the testicles, which is the orchiectomy, then you don't have to take as many pills, so you're not affecting your liver as much. Why are you giving a, a whole anatomy about things? We're talking about sex. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but I'm talking about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, There's a big like thing that. there. <laughs> There's a big thing there because I remember, like, for me, prior to chest surgery, um, I had I was a giver, not a receiver. Even when I lived in a lesbian lifestyle, I was the giver, not the receiver. I never actually had an orgasm prior to having chest surgery because I never felt comfortable enough with my body to share myself with my partner. Whereas now I'm in a mutual relationship where, and I'm with a biological female um, who actually identifies as a straight female. She's never been with girls. Um, so, and I'm her first FDM, but we are comfortable sharing my body. Like we're both comfortable. And it, it, there's a big difference once you become comfortable with yourself, sex just becomes so much better. Oh, definitely. No doubt. Well, we've got, a minute and 22 seconds left of the show, and I guess the How to Prevent Wrinkles is going to have to stay for tomorrow. So yes. those ladies that are waiting for me to talk to How to Prevent Wrinkles, you'll have to wait for tomorrow. Anything else you wanted to add, Cece? Gosh, no, you, you guys are pretty much on the wavelength, you know. It's just, you know, I, I am oh, looking forward. I, I'm looking forward to having sex. Let's just say that. <laughs> Whereas in the, oh, in no, the okay. past, it was, like, it was a chore. Well, we will we will be on Skype um, around 11:45 for those who want to join in on Skype Transition Radio, so we can continue all this conversation and moving forward uh, on Skype in a group conversation if you want, which would be I think awesome. Sweet. Join us on Transition Radio and CC. Okay, right. I'll have to download Skype on my computer and then I'll do it for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Again, I apologize for not being able to uh, stay longer to prevent wrinkles, but uh, that will happen tomorrow.
And looking forward to tomorrow night. I love these shows. They're just too short. And uh, we'll have to do something to make it longer soon. Anyway, thank you. Have a great night. And talk to you guys tomorrow. And love yourselves as much as we love you. Good night. Good night. Yeah.